<clears throat> Thank you, Father, for the privilege that you've given us to gather together um, and to explore your word and see the truly marvelous things that you've left there for us to discover. Thank you for your spirit and his illuminating ministry, which helps us to understand these things that you want to show us that we might understand more about you and about your plan. Um, open our minds and our hearts this morning that these things might become a source of blessing and challenge for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're picking up in chapter 11 this morning, and uh, we're going to be looking right off the bat at these, these two witnesses. So we're going to continue with this parenthetical insert <clears throat> into the chronological narrative of Revelation. After 11 14, we sort of briefly pick up the narrative again with mention of the seventh trumpet, and then we slip back into this parent parenthetical interlude in chapter 12 to <clears throat> introduce details to flesh out some of the events and some of the characters of the tribulation. This interlude <clears throat> goes all the way to chapter 15, where the seven vials or bowls are introduced. Meanwhile, here in chapter 11, we meet two witnesses and try to understand their meaning and purpose. All right. <clears throat> Revelation 11, 1. Then I was given a reed, like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. <coughs> These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn into blood and strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, and tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them, those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. <clears throat> All right. So John's given a read, and he's to use this as a measuring strip stick. The reading view is likely one of those from the Jordan River Valley. They're along about 15 to 20 feet of straight and very light, making a very handy measuring stick. Even though the reed grows to 15 to 20 feet, it's not stated how long this one is, but I believe we can assume it is the full size since there's no indication of it being shortened. 
<clears throat> the term the angel stood saying is not rendered that way in some manuscripts. It may be the voice of God and it was said would be a more accurate translation. John is told to measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, or it has been given to the Gentiles, <clears throat> and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. He's to measure three things, the temple, the altar, and those who worship there. The temple of God refers to the holy place and the holy of holies, which are two parts of the temple. <clears throat> the altar is almost certainly the brazen altar. Only priests could go into the temple, but those not priests could approach the brazen altar with their sacrifices. Measuring seems to signify God staking off his claim especially when we see the outer courts being given to the Gentiles as being excluded. This would suggest the temple, the altar, and those who worship there are God's own. We see support for this measuring elsewhere in Scripture. In Zechariah, man is seen measuring Jerusalem, a scene that portrays God's coming divine judgment on the city. In Ezekiel 40, the temple and the future kingdom is measured with a reed. In Revelation 20, the new Jerusalem is measured. The temple here <clears throat> is the one that exists during the tribulation. As previously mentioned, plans are already drawn and materials are claimed to be in the process of collection. It is predicted extra biblically that with plans and pre-positioned material, the temple can be built in as little as nine months. Some say even shorter, but probably not longer than 18. This is the temple that will be desecrated by the Antichrist halfway through the tribulation. Originally constructed for worship by the Jews, it's going to be taken over by the Antichrist and becomes the site of an idol of this wannabe world ruler. Second Thessalonians 2 3, we see this let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And in Revelation 13, 11, then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Those whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth. By those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. <laughs> He was granted the power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And Daniel 9, 27 also refers to this. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offerings. And on the wing of abominations, which shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. And Dan. Daniel 12, 8, although I heard, I did not understand. 
Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days, three and a half years. It's significant that John is told to measure not only the temple and the altar, but also the worshipers. I think this is saying that God is the judge of man's worship and man's character, and all must give an account to him. And since the reed is much longer than a man is tall, he's found not measuring God's divine standard. <clears throat> Some believe God is not only claiming ownership by his measuring of the temple and the altar, but he's also demonstrating the shortcomings of the worshipers who do not measure up to his standard. And the second part of this verse is instructions not to measure the outer court, uh, as this is given over to the Gentiles for 42 months, which is three and a half years. We know from Daniel 9 that the tribulation is seven years long. This is the first half, is this the first half or is this the second half when this is taking place? Most think this period is the second half after the Antichrist has taken over the temple and instituted idol worship. If so, then we would be viewing this as God's measuring and finding all the temple, the altar, and the worshipers not measuring up. But I think that's how we should view this. And I will clarify this in, the, in a moment. <clears throat> Revelation 11.3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Those are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemy. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of the prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn the blood and to strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. So we now introduce two witnesses and some complications. These two prophecies for 1,260 days, half of the tribulation, they are two olive trees and two lampstands. Now, lampstands symbolize their witness for Christ. Olive oil is related to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. These are two spirit-enabled and protected evangelists. They're dressed in sackcloth, which symbolizes humility and service. They have miraculous powers and can destroy those who threaten them. Fire comes out of their mouths and consumes their enemies kind of like a human flamethrower. They are protected and can't be killed, but can inflict death on others. They have the power to shut up heaven. And this is the first heaven, that is the sky above, and stop rain from falling. And no rain falls during the period of their prophesy, 1,260 days. They can turn the waters, the streams, the rivers, and the lakes into blood. They can strike the earth with plagues as often as they wish. And I imagine that will be all. Verse 8 tells us they're in Jerusalem. These two make life miserable for those on earth. We know that by the reaction of mankind when they are killed. At this point, I believe we're mostly dealing with unbelievers, and many, if not all, are either demon-possessed possessed, or heavily demon-influenced. The hatred of these demons is directed at the two witnesses. This is made even worse by their inability to shut them up. Since their witness is primarily to Israel, it seems unbelieving Israel is primarily rejecter and hater of these two. Much like they hated the message of Jesus, their Messiah, in the first century. 
But the word, but the world is also hearing this and also hating us. Their message is going worldwide, as is suggested later in the text when we see the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations rejoicing at their deaths. There are many opinions concerning the identity of these two witnesses, some reasonable, some pretty outlandish. Some say there are simply two witnesses God will raise up in the last days. They're not special, and what is important is their testimony. Some identify one of them as Enoch, who did not experience death and was translated. The scriptures say man is appointed to die once, but those alive at the rapture do not experience death. They are translated, but Enoch was a Gentile. And this is a return to the age of Israel. That might exclude him. Some say one is John the Baptist because he came in the spirit of Elijah, who was prophesied to come back before the Lord's coming. John claimed he was not Elijah. Some say one, some say one, one of these two is Elijah. He did not die, if that means anything. Malachi 4, 5 through 6 says Elijah will come back. And here it is. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and their hearts to the, of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Jewish tradition calls for Elijah's return, and they set a place for him at their Passover seders. He's associated with fire judgment. He called down fire on the altar that he soaked with water, one of my favorite stories. He also withheld rain from the earth for three days. If they can be identified, Elijah is likely one of the two witnesses. Moses is potentially the other. He manifests plagues on Egypt. He's intimately associated with Israel and his deliverance. Scripture says he was about to die, but no one witnessed his death or saw his body, if that means anything. It was both Moses and Elijah that were seen at the transfiguration of Jesus. That's in Matthew 17. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us, is it good for it is good for us to be here if you wish. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It seems logical that Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses. They're associated with Israel, and we often see references to Moses and the prophets as capturing all of the teachings delivered to Israel. Moses and Elijah would capture that concept in two people. And the Matthew passage above, which comes in relation to a passage on the second coming, seems to be strong support to me. What is important is their message, not necessarily who they are. It's their message that is hated and gets them killed. Revelation eleven seven. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, and tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days, and not only their dead bodies to be put, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. A little side note here. Some years ago, some misguided and scripturally ignorant greeting card company made a Christmas card with the message, 
make merry and send gifts to one another. Mm. All right. The scene of these their witness is Jerusalem, which is here described in negative terms. That is the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem is seen as a city of idolatry and sin at this point. The beast that comes out of the pit, the Antichrist, makes war against them and kills them. The word that's translated as killed implies the end of life. How they are killed is not specified, but they're not killed until they finish their testimony. They have divine protection from death until their purpose in life is complete. They're not buried, as is demanded by the law, and their bodies lie in the street in Jerusalem for three and a half days to be viewed by the people's tribes, tongues, and nations. This suggests they're famous, and since it's illogical that the world would travel to Jerusalem to view their bodies, the event must be broadcast somehow worldwide. The word street is a Greek word for wide street, or what we might call a boulevard. Whatever else that implies, it suggests it's a very public place. The reaction by mankind to their deaths is generally one of rejoicing. They send gifts to each other like Christmas. This is universal in rejoicing at the deaths of these two. And their testimony must have been very convicting for that level of hatred. When does this occur? We know they testify for three and a half years, and because of the tribulation is seven years long, conveniently divided into two periods of three and a half years, the tendency is to stuff their testimony into one or the other of those two half periods. Strong arguments have been made for both periods, and even for the three and a half years of their testimony overlapping both halves. My money is on the first half for several reasons. First, there's nothing in scripture that you can point to as proof text for one or the other. If it's the second half, then they must be acted during a period of time when things are truly intense with global warfare, which I think will overshadow their testimony. <clears throat> Next point. With their death, in verse 10, mankind celebrates three and a half days and sends gifts to each other. If their witness is in the second half, that would be the very end of the tribulation. And at its very worst point, it's not logical in my mind that men will be celebrating anything beyond personal survival during that period, much less sending gifts to each other. Then verse 7 says, coming up, says the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit will make war against them. That event is associated with Satan releasing the demons at the midpoint, as we saw in chapter 9. Their witness must be during a period when they can be heard and it can have an impact. The second half seemed way too intense for that to work very well. I believe their testimony is mostly during the first half of the tribulation and overlaps slightly maybe into the second half. I believe their death is one of the first things that the Antichrist initiates around the time of his setting up the idol in the temple, which is at the midpoint of the tribulation. So I think the timing looks something like this. The events of chapter 11 are seen in reverse order. The witnesses begin their ministry near the beginning of the tribulation and witness for the first half when they are most likely to be heard and to be effective. Israel is under the protection of some kind of peace treaty for the first half, and thus the beast that comes out of the pit has not yet established active authority and dominion in Jerusalem. Satan is released at the midpoint, and that's when the Antichrist invades Israel in response to an invasion by this northern confederation. We'll see this in more detail when we study the campaign of Armageddon. And that's when he breaks the treaty, 
And that's when he assumes dictatorial control of Jerusalem. And when he sets up the idol in the temple. And that's when he rids himself of these two annoying witnesses. The measuring of the temple, the altar, and the worshipers all take place after the Antichrist has taken over the temple, set up the idol, and killed the two witnesses. All three, temple, altar, and idol worshipers, are found to not measure up to God's standards. Thus, the instructions to measure only the temple of God and the altar of those who worship there. God claims what is his own. There's no proof text I can point to that dogmatically states that this is the case. But hinting passages and extrapol extrapolations suggest it is. There are expositors, expositors that agree with me, like Ryrie, and there are those who not do not, like Wal Walvard. Frankly, many expositors say we cannot dogmatically be dogmatic on any of this relating to the two witnesses, not their identities, nor the timing of their testimonies. Elaine, do you think that these three and a half days are days or they're not years, right? I mean, and how do we differentiate? Yeah, there are some people that try and make that interpretation that this three and a half days, and they are places in scripture where a day does equal a year. Um, but I don't think this is the case. I think this is literally three and a half days um, and then they're resurrected. All right, verse 11, 11. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God of heaven. So, <clears throat> in the midst of their celebrating and dancing around these two rotting corpses, we have, whoops, God breathed life into the dead witnesses. <laughs> They stand upright, which must have shocked more than a few, and a loud voice calls to them, come up here. And to the utter amazement of those present, they ascend into heaven in a cloud. All of this is before the eyes of those who hate them. <clears throat> then we have an earthquake, and a tenth of the city is destroyed, and 7,000 people are killed. Suddenly, the doubters are afraid and give glory to God. Some translations use the term remnant here, and that suggests these doubters may now be believers. Their testimony was effective, at least to some degree. It was intense and meaningful enough that they were convicted by it, and they hated them for it. They didn't want to hear it, and they rejoiced when they thought they were dead, and the tormenting testimony of the witnesses was finally silence. But then God brought them back to life and brought on an earthquake. Tim LaHaye suggests these events brought, brought on a Jewish revival that swept Israel. They finally respond to the message of the two witnesses when they saw God resurrecting them. Elsewhere, we see people witness incredible events, and they still curse God and do not repent. Here, they fear God and give glory to him. That sounds like new converts to me. Were these two witnesses resurrected? And there are two camps on this point. One says they died and were resurrected. Many expositors are in this camp. Others say they were not resurrected, but they were resuscitated, that life was breathed into their natural human bodies, and the text seemed to suggest this. Verse 11 says the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. They're talking corpses here, and they come back to life with no suggestion of a resurrection, that is, corruption that puts on incorruption. 
Another reason this is not likely a resurrection is that they are Jews, and Israel does not experience their resurrection until the end of the tribulations, which we'll look at later in this study. I'm in the camp that they are miraculously restored to life like Lazarus was after being dead for three days. He lived for a time and then later died. These two are killed, restored to life, but they're taken to heaven in bodily form. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. <clears throat> so we have the seventh trumpet showing up now in verse uh, 15. <clears throat> then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants and prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, <clears throat> and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings and noises and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. All right, so the seventh trumpet sounds. <clears throat> and John hears loud voices in heaven saying, the kings of the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. In contrast, previously a single voice made the pronouncement. And now we have many voices. This sounds to me like the saints rejoicing at the coming fulfillment of God's plan rather than God or an angel pronouncing some judgment. What's the meaning of the statement, the kingdoms of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord? Let's look at a couple of passages on this. <clears throat> in Daniel 2.44, and in the days of the, these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all those kingdoms and will stand forever. So there's a reference to a forever kingdom. And then in verse 11 of Daniel 7, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words from the horn which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and giving to the burning flame. Sounds like the end of the tribulation. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. Their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. Then Zechariah 14.1 says this, Behold, the day is coming for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all of the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, east to west, by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other half south, southward. And you shall flee the valley of my mountains 
for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day shall be no light, cold, or froth, and there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Neither day nor light, but all evening time shall be light, and all day living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. The day is coming when the kingdoms of the world will be in total submission to our Lord, when he will be king of kings and Lord of lords. The passage in Revelation 11 is looking at that day. The kingdoms of this world have become. This is a prophetic use of the aorist participle already a fact. They are only in the, we are only in the seventh trumpet We've seen seven bowls. We still have seven bowls to go. So how should this proclamation of kingdoms of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord be taken? We're looking at the completion of the tribulation and the institution of the millennial reign of Christ. In chapter 11, we've looked at events that encompass the entire seven years of the tribulation from the two witnesses to the abomination and desolation to the end and now beyond into the kingdom. If we take the position that the seventh seal encompasses the seventh trumpet and the seventh trumpet captures within it all seven bowls, then we are seeing in verse 15 with the sounding of the seventh trumpet all of the events associated with the seven bowls and what immediately follows, which is the second advent, as well as the judgment of those that brought about all this in the sense of bringing their evil actions to an end. More on this later in the study. Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All those who have existed as autonomous earthly kingdoms with their leadership answerable in their minds to no one, with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the process of destruction of earthly power is underway. The prophetic use of the aorist participle indicates it's already considered a fact. All earthly dominions are now effectively under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ with all that is implied in that, which we're going to look at in a moment. Note also, that the passage says Jesus will reign forever and ever. The 1,000-year reign of the King of Kings will begin with the second advent. Then why does the passage say that? Remember that Revelation, at least this portion related to the tribulation, is a return to the age of Israel. So remarks here should be considered in the context of the age of Israel. Israel viewed the kingdom as eternal. They know nothing about these 1,000 years we in the church call the millennium. While their view of the kingdom is eternal, is completely accurate, is not completely complete. There are three aspects or sections of the kingdom. There is the millennium. There is the eternal kingdom as a continuation of the millennium. And then we have the spiritual aspects of the kingdom that we get to experience during the church age. Speaking to Israel, both Jesus and John the Baptist said the kingdom was at hand, meaning it was near. Were they wrong? 
No, on two points. Israel was being offered the kingdom, but they refused the king and thus lost the kingdom. It was then offered to the Gentiles. So the kingdom was literally near if they had accepted the king. Because of verse one, of number one, we are, ex we in the church age are experiencing aspects of the kingdom during this age. Many of the spiritual features of the kingdom are ours to enjoy now. And some spiritual features that are available to church age believers, we get to experience some aspects of the new covenant to Israel an unconditional grace covenant resting on the I will of God. The new covenant promises the impartation of a renewed mind and heart, which we call regeneration. The new covenant provides for restoration to the favor and blessing of God. It provides for the forgiveness of sin is also included in the covenant. For I will remove their iniquity, I will remove their sin, remember their sin no more. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is also included in the new covenant. This is seen by comparing Jeremiah 31 33 with Ezekiel 36 27. There's your homework. The teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit will be manifested, and the will of God will be known by obedient hearts. The new covenant says God promised Israel the sanctuary will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. For it is written, I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. During the church age, the Spirit of God lives within us, and our bodies are the temple of God. A promise of the new covenant is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation of all of the blessings of the new covenant. For by the blood of thy covenant, I will send forth your prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. In a church age context, the blood of Christ is the foundation of our salvation and our relationship with God. In the New Covenant, in Jeremiah 31, God says, they, Israel, will be my people, I will be their God, implying a personal relationship we know only comes through faith. The church age believers are God's literal children through the new birth. And God the Father is our literal spiritual father, and as such, we are his people and he is our God. Israel only saw the eternal kingdom, not that part of it we call the millennium. In their scriptures, it is pictured as both eternal and earthly, whereas the church sees these other aspects not revealed to Israel. Because of Revelation, we know about the millennium. Because of the great Pauline epistles, we know about the spiritual aspects of the kingdom that we enjoy in this church age. Even though we're enjoying these benefits promised to Israel, that does not mean the church has replaced Israel in God's economy. Some features of the kingdom are not ours in the church age, such as the earthly reign of Christ. Christ does not reign on earth yet. He does reign in the hearts of believers. It is not physical in the same way it will be in eternity. We don't have the universal peace and prosperity that will characterize the kingdom. The earthly kings are far from subject to the will of God like during the kingdom when Jesus is reigning physically and literally on earth as the king of kings. And that is the end of our study today, and we get into chapter 12 sometime next week, which gets really intense. All right, I think somebody may have some questions here. Well, I've got a statement here, Lane, is uh, 
you look at this and I don't know whether anybody picks it up, but the whole world, not just those people in Jerusalem, witnessed this. And you say, well, how is that possible? And you look at the technology we have today, and we had a commentator say, imagine CNN with their cameras in Jerusalem broadcasting live these three and a half days. And all of a sudden, they say, what? And they turn around, these three guys stand up. And two, three guys, two guys, I'm sorry, two guys stand up. So what some say, and I, I truly think this is very possible, is the whole world witnesses this either live or on YouTube or someplace. I mean, it is all captured by film and newscast, and it's all seen by the world. With that said, why doesn't the whole world believe? And I think you hit that already. They hate it. Their anger leads to unbelief regardless of what they see. So I thought it was an interesting twist. I'm just throwing it out for people to see. Another thing I thought of while you went through this, it, it, speaking of the global celebration, it must be that their curses or things went past their immediate surroundings. Because why, you know, I mean, we can passively watch something like that with interest, but why would I celebrate unless I was also subject to those curses here? And we were, I think. Yeah. And I hadn't thought of it being past their immediate location before. Well, I think it's the whole world, is it not? Mm -hmm. the the yeah. 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 I think everybody sees this. I they all experience are... the curses. Yeah. I'm sorry. They all experience the curses. They experience what? The curses. The curses that they. <clears throat> yeah, some of these curses uh, must be worldwide, and I think some of them we've already seen that in some of the other um, passages we've studied. That maybe some of these curses came from them. Look at the pandemics oh. today. Speculation, of course. Mm -hmm. What was your question, Dave? I said, look at the pandemics today. There are worldwide curses. <clears throat> right. You guys are sitting back from your microphone, and it's a little hard for me to understand you. I don't know maybe anybody else has that problem, but of course, y'all know I have hearing issues. So, <clears throat> well, I have speaking issues, so we're even. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, some interesting things that, uh, you know, I actually wrote a book on this um, many, many years ago, never published it. I'm glad it did get published because it's in subsequent studies, I've concluded that I should have handled some parts of it differently. But anyway, this was an interesting part for me to write because I, I wrote, uh, tried to create the scene of these guys and this fireball coming out of their mouth. It was amazing just to think of what, what this must have been like and to those who were there and experienced it, even those who just watched it on the TV screen somewhere. <clears throat> and you have to wonder, you know, that so much of the world did not respond positively to this that um, you can see that had to be demon possession and very strong demon influence on those who were not possessed. But look who responded. It appears to be mainly it was Jews that responded to this. And that was probably mainly their um, message of these two. And that makes sense when you consider that Revelation, this period, this seven-year period, is a return to the age of Israel, the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, and that Israel would be the focus, and God is trying to bring his people to faith. Yeah, the, the question there that always comes up, and I don't, I don't want to get into this, is, all right, what is Israel? Uh, is Israel all the Jews across all the world? Is it thinking of it that broad? Or is Israel just Judea? 
or is Israel, is Israel the northern kingdom and Judea brought back together? Is Israel just Hebrew and no Gentile? You get into all these questions as to what's the real definition of Israel when it talks about Israel in this very broad term. And so my, my point, I, I think it's really, Israel's looked at as, as being Jewish here, whether it be Hebrew or Gentile, you could be a proselyte and still be Jewish. And so that's just my view. But you get into all those different things as to what is Israel? What's the definition of Israel as you read through this? Well, it's two Israels. <clears throat> there is the physical DNA Israel, um, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> and then there is spiritual Israel, and we would be included in spiritual Israel through faith in Christ. But I think the focus here is on physical Israel, <clears throat> and which is defined as or seen elsewhere as God's people. And he has a special interest in the nation Israel and working through the nation Israel as a testimony to the rest of the world. So I think the focus is primarily the DNA Jew here and less so, although not excluded, of course, those who would come to Christ, to the saving knowledge of Christ, um, who are Gentiles. But the, like I said, the, this is the return to the age of Israel. And the church age has ended and was terminated with the rapture of the church. And now we're back to dealing with Israel just like we were in the time of Jesus. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I tend to agree with that. I add that it is physical, but there could be some non blood relationship because of a proselyte. In sure. terms of Jewish. Of course. And the second point here is it's all over the world. There's Jews everywhere. Yeah. There's his descendants were scattered, right? Though they're they are said to come back together. Maybe they all come back together physically in this new nation, Israel, and none of them are left in the world. And this is isolated and just you know the physical country. I don't know, but it's it's not a big deal. I'm just saying that. You got people that go all over the board with it, and it's just a discussion item. Yeah, Revelation leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next week, uh, we wrap up this part of chapter 11. And I think we get into chapter 12, which is really an important part of the scripture that we're going to be getting into. So until next week, shall we close with a prayer? Thank you again, Father, for your precious word and the things that you left there for us to discover and the ministry of your spirit in our hearts to uh, open us to the truth that you uh, wish to show us. Help us through this week, Father, that we might be witnesses for you in Satan's world and that we might uh, help lead others to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.